all for joining us today for um, a webinar which is focused on race and sports. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the respective lands that we're all seated on today. For me, that is the Wurundjeri peoples and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude for the care and kinship they have shown these lands for thousands of years and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. I would also like to encourage all participants to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that they are all seated on today. Now, normally at this stage of the webinars, I also like to acknowledge some familiar faces in the crowd and also welcome new ones. But to be honest, everybody kind of looks the same today, almost like a blank screen. Just to introduce myself, I'm Eza. I'm a youth volunteer with uh, CMY uh, uh, for multiple of their uh, programs, including the, including the Explore program. And it's my pleasure to be here today. A few things to note before we get started. If you look at the bottom of your screens, there should be a Q&A tab. Please submit your questions into that and we will do our best to address them in the Q&A session. I would now like to uh, hand over to my co-host, uh, Ramon. Thank you, Eza. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be able to co-facilitate this uh, webinar with you today and I welcome all of you uh, to this webinar on the important topic of racism in, uh, in sport and with a particular focus on community sport. Now, as some of you may be aware from previous uh, webinars, this webinar is part of uh, the CRIS series. So CRIS stands for the Center for Resilient and Inclusive Societies, a consortium that uh, among many other activities uh, has been hosting a series of, of conversations around race. And we're very pleased today to be able to extend those conversations to the realm of sport. Uh, and uh, again, with today, a particular focus on community sport. Now, uh, particularly in times of pandemic, we might appreciate social function or the, the, the meanings of sport as a glue, as a way to connect, as a way to express oneself in a bodily manner, to, to break boundaries really, to, to, to connect and engage with, with other human beings uh, 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 from different backgrounds and uh, with different backgrounds and abilities. Yet at the same time, I think this is also a very important time to acknowledge once again, and to actually uh, 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 create more awareness and action towards uh, the understanding that sport is also a context marked by various forms of exclusion and discrimination, uh, both in terms of everyday expressions of exclusion or, or, or discrimination, and also, of course, as we've seen, for example, with the recent uh, uh, review into uh, systemic racism at Collingwood Football Club, for example, in, this, in, in terms of institutional racism. And so what we want to do today is really for a focus on community sport, really hone in on sort of what are the key issues here? What is the, what is the, the state of play? What are the challenges? But also what are some of the, the best practices or the, the next practices currently uh, available to us? And, and really doing so in, in dialogue with our panelists today to really start uh, strengthening and, and, uh, an ongoing conversation, understanding this as a, a long-term process uh, towards more equitable, safe and inclusive sporting environments and more specifically promoting uh, anti-racism in community sport to ensure that uh, it can be a more positive experience for, for people of all backgrounds and abilities. And so as and I are very pleased to be able to uh, call on three panelists today to help us sort of, uh, navigate through some of these, these, these key questions and, and, and conversations. So uh, today our first speaker will be Jonas Gebra Michael uh, from the Center for Multicultural Youth. And uh, he will be followed by Dr. Karen Block uh, from the University of Melbourne, who I'll introduce in more detail later. And the third panelist today will be uh, Karen McLeod, CEO, CEO of The Huddle. And this will be followed by uh, a Q&A. And as, as I said, we, we really invite your questions and we hope to be able to, to pose a number of your questions to the panel and to make this really a, a collective conversation uh, on, on this important topic. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, our first speaker today, who is uh, Jonas Gebra Michael. Uh, well, Jonas, I think is very well placed to, to, to comment on some of these issues, also from, from both 
personal and professional experience as an avid soccer player, a fan, uh, a community sports professional who's worked in, in several community sports settings in youth work and in advocacy, uh, both in Australia and in overseas. So Jonas began his career in community sports with Auckland City Council, working to build relationships with local soccer clubs in order to design sort of alternative, uh, uh, more meaningful programs for young people from a refugee and background, uh, refugee and migrant background. Uh, Jonas then joined the Centre for Multicultural Youth, one of the partners in the Chris Consortium, as a sport project officer supporting young people from diverse backgrounds to join formal and informal sports programs in Melbourne's West. Uh, and in various roles with CMY, Jonas has worked closely with local councils, community groups, non-government organisations, as well as families and young people. As a youth worker, advocate, uh, project officer, and training and delivering programs and services aimed to increase newly arrived communities' access to and, and engagement in uh, uh, in sport in, in various ways. So, uh, well, who, who better to start off with uh, than with uh, Jonas? So, Jonas, I'd like to give you the floor for your uh, insights on this, uh, this vital topic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ramon, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here speaking as well as be part of the for this very important conversation. Um, so as uh, Ramon highlighted, I have uh, worked in the sports sector, uh, supporting marginalized young people as well as people that are from diverse uh, multicultural background in Auckland and um, in Melbourne. So I've had um, the privilege of experiencing working with similar cohorts, but in, very, in two different cities. Uh, and the experience has been quite similar. Uh, but to start with, uh, I would like to share a little bit of my personal experience. Um, um, arriving in New Zealand as a child uh, many, many years ago, um, sport played a very important role in my life. Um, and it was a vehicle for me to um, connect, um, learn the language, learn the culture, uh, and feel like I belong in a country that was completely different to my previous home. Um, and, and it played, like I said, a very pivotal role and I quickly uh, picked up the language, uh, made friends, um, felt a lot more at home than I did when I initially arrived. Um, but it's not to say that there wasn't um, uncomfortable experiences that, that I experienced throughout my time playing. Um, at the early stages, um, very oblivious to um, racist comments or um, racist incidents that's, that happened to me. Um, to be honest, I was too, um, I was having so much fun enjoying myself that I wasn't too concerned about what was happening. And honestly, my level of English wasn't to, to a point where I can understand what people were saying to me, probably the best at that age. Um, but as I got older towards my late teen um, years, I was a bit more mindful when uh, spectators, opponents uh, would make uh, racial comments or would get a little bit abusive to, in games, sometimes just even walking uh, onto the field. Um, but even then, like I said, I was, I was more focused on enjoying myself, uh, people and, and making new friends and connecting um, outside of my own small community of, of my family. Um, so I wasn't um, paying too much attention to that. Um, fast forward many years um, in, in um, Melbourne though, uh, I have had the privilege of, through my work, connecting to a very special uh, sports club based in Albion, Brimbank. Um, the club called the Community Soccer Hub was established about six, seven years ago with the support of several NGOs, including CMY, uh, the local council, Brimbank, and Football Victoria um, Federation um, to create a space, a welcoming space for people of diverse background who are very newly arrived to the country, uh, who face many challenges in participating um, in sports and formal sports anyway. Um, that includes uh, the cost, uh, travel, uh, being in an environment that they're not used to, which is very formal and very, um, uh, that requires a lot of commitment. Um, so the last uh, five years, which I've been involved in, in the soccer hub, uh, we have created internal programs that allows those um, 
that can that cannot afford to participate in more external uh, uh, competition to participate internally, which removes the barrier of traveling. Uh, we reduce the cost uh, enormously. Occasionally, we remove the cost of the very newly arrived to the country. Um, and everyone that does participate, although they have the the common theme, which is they are from the uh, diverse background and the love of sport, uh, football that is, uh, are all from a very diverse background, um, uh, different religion, different culture, different language. Um, so we have worked hard to create um, a space where everyone feels, where everyone knows what it means to belong, uh, where people respect each other's uh, culture, uh, each other's differences, um, and and um, attend to participate and enjoy themselves and connect. Um, but in my time as a as a senior team player, but as well as a coach, I've observed so many, uh, several incidents that were quite uncomfortable. Uh, personally, for me, having gone through the experience in the past, I have had uh, ways and ways to deal with such situations. Uh, but it was very uncomfortable for me when witnessing people that are very newly arrived to the country or are from asylum seeker background who face a lot of challenges in their own day-to-day -day life anyway, who attend, who join us just to feel a bit more connected, but also to get away from those challenges that they face. Uh, so those several incidents that I'm talking about during games where players sometimes trying to get that psychological advantage will make very hurtful or racist um, slurs. And for those uh, specific individuals that I'm talking about who are very new to the country, uh, quite found a little bit confronting and will react and, and, and not in the fashion that we'd like them to react, not in the culture that we've set within our group anyway, uh, but honestly speaking, um, given uh, what they were called and how they were treated, I can't really judge on how uh, they responded sometimes. Um, but also on occasions where, and this is not a regular occasion, but on certain occasions where referees will have a pretty uh, preconceived judgment on some of the uh, participants. Um, I could recall from memory a, a particular referee calling uh, some of our players before they are about to start aggressive. <laughs> so I had a pretty, a, a quite conceived idea of what these particular uh, players are like. Um, we've had certain moments where referees have really mistreated our players uh, to a point where opposing teams have offered to support us and, and make complaints to the governing body. Um, yeah, so it's, it makes it a little really uncomfortable when we are in our own uh, space to explain this to very new uh, right young people, um, is, um, people who experience this, like I mentioned. I have experienced it for a long time occasionally, so I have come up with a way of dealing with things on when, it, when I have to deal with it. Um, so we, on many occasions, in small groups or as a working group um, from the community soccer uh, with players like who are from very different background have discussed what will be the ideal um, act, uh, things that should happen when to remove such things from occurring. Um, and personally, my personal um, opinion, as well as opinions that I've heard from my committee members, as well as teammates and uh, co-coaches, is it takes everyone contributing a little bit to remove um, such things from happening. Uh, that includes governing bodies, um, uh, the clubs who should act um, responsible for their spectators and players and take action when certain spectators and players um, make uh, such comments or act abusive towards some players. Uh, and obviously within our own control, we try to um, um, assure that we act in a more respectful manner and not always um, be very responsive to every um, abusive um, incident that happens. Um, but like I said, it takes everyone contributing in order to create a safe or welcoming a space wherever the competition is played. Um, it does get a little bit frustrating at times when you have, it happens a little bit more than you would like it to happen. Uh, and you get kind of fed up having to complain 
on a regular basis. Uh, that's not to say that the governing bodies have not been very responsive um, in most cases, um, but it just, it gets tiring having to always um, bring things up um, and always having to explain itself on a regular basis. Um, so it is, it is, it is a, a, a conversation that needs to be had, but also um, it is everybody's responsibility, everyone involved from players, clubs, governing bodies to play, uh, to contribute, to play a role in ensuring that racism is removed um, from sport. Because ultimately we're all there for the same reason, uh, to, to play, engage, connect, um, and to, to feel part of a community, uh, a club, or uh, whether it be social or competitive club is pretty much a community, it's, it's a second home for most of us. Um, yeah, that's all I've had to share for now. And I will hand it over to uh, Ramon or Eli, or Ali, sorry. Thank you, Jonas. Thank, thank you very much for enlightening us with, uh, uh, with your own experiences. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a number of questions and we'll be able to build on that with the, the other two speakers. And uh, so we'll definitely return to those very important uh, insights. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to uh, Dr. Karen Block. Dr. Ke so we're switching now really from, from, from grassroots sort of community action to uh, academia. Having said that, uh, uh, Karen's work, uh, which I know well, is, is incredibly sort of socially engaged and is also uh, very community focused. And so we'll see lots of applications and I think cross fertilization here between uh, uh, policy and practice and, uh, and academia. So uh, Karen is a senior research fellow in the Center for Health Equity at the University of Melbourne, uh, where she also leads the Migration and Social Cohesion Research Program for the Melbourne Social Equity Institute. Uh, Karen is well known for her research with immigrant and refugee background young people, women, women and families, focus on social inclusion, sport, health inequalities, and gender-based violence. And Karen is currently leading a community-based participatory action research project called STARS, Standing Together Against Racism in Sport. Uh, and I must also say that Karen is, is clearly one of Australia's leading researchers in this space. So uh, Karen, we're very lucky to have you here and I really look forward to your, uh, your views and your experiences uh, uh, in this space. So I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Ramon, for that very flattering introduction. Um, it's much appreciated. Now, I hope I, I've just, just while Jonas was speaking, I lost connection for a while and I'm back. So I hope I don't have any, any further problems, but um, so I'll, I'll start from here. Um, so uh, yeah, I have both a personal and a professional interest in, in sport and inclusion and racism. Um, I too am a soccer player. I play for a community club. I, I represent the kind of age diversity um, part of <laughs> that program. But uh, many years ago, actually, when, before I was playing myself and I was a, a mother and a committee member at a club and I, um, we managed to get a small grant, um, which we used to um, subsidise fees for some young people from African ref and refugee backgrounds to join the club. And all, all went well for quite a long time, but um, Towards the end of the season, we were play, they, that team was playing against another team um, out in the outer suburbs, and uh, there was some racist sledging that happened in during the match. Um, there was a very young referee who didn't really know what to do about it, and eventually a fight broke out, and um, all of the players from our team and the other team um, were. Um, penalised, the club was fined a large amount of money and the club basically threw its hands up and said, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do this, you know, we don't know how, how to make this work. Um, so that was a pretty depressing introduction, I guess, to this, to try to do, do some good things in this area. Um, so fast forward a few years and I, um, I, my research is very much focused on promoting social inclusion and well-being for migrant and refugee communities. And in much of the research that I've done, sport, has, even when it's not sport related, sport has come up as something that young people are really keen to do more of. Um, we know that there are a lot of barriers to participation. Um, and I was really keen to do research in the area of um, trying to, I guess, address some of those barriers. So 
So I'm going to share my screen now just to show you um, some of the work that we've done in this space. Um, hopefully, let me know if that's not working, but I'm hoping you can see my screen at this point. Um, so a project we did a few years ago was called Count Me In, and that was all about um, promoting participation in sport for um, children and young people from migrant and refugee backgrounds. Um, and what we did there, we had a range of community partners. You should be able to see their logos there on the screen. And we um, employed uh, people from migrant backgrounds as what we call multicultural um, support coordinators. And so they helped to link in families whose kids weren't playing sport previously into mainstream community clubs who also partnered with us. And we had a um, we were really successful in this project. We had about 300 kids from migrant and refugee backgrounds who all started playing sport for the first time in a range of different sports with a range of different clubs. And most of them had really positive experiences. However, we did also encounter um, racism in this project now. Um, so I've just changed slides and hopefully that's working as well. Uh, so um, as part of this project, obviously, we, we had the action part, which was getting kids into clubs, and then we did um, surveys and focus groups and interviews around that to, to find out more about people's experiences. Um, and a couple, of, a couple of the things that came up around racism are really um, shown up in these quotes. So the first one um, was a young person who was playing in one of the clubs who said, the parents especially, their language on the field wasn't right, and the coaches from the other team. Many times our team would win. It's not just the players are saying the racist stuff, but the parents as well. Um, so I had kids reporting back to me that they were experiencing racism on the field um, when they were playing. Um, and that, that's really a, an example of just overt racism. But we also saw what I'd describe as institutional and structural racism. And this often took the form of resistance and, and this um, idea that there was no need, was that a club shouldn't be making special provisions for people who came from different backgrounds. So the second quote was at a club where we had actually brought in a lot of players um, into that club as part of our project who were Muslim. Um, and they used to have Friday, after training, they would hold a sausage, sausage sizzle every Friday. Um, and this was one of, the, this was the person that we were working with at the club who was very, um, very keen to really make this project work, but he was getting a lot of resistance from other people on the committee. So he reported back that a couple of times they've asked for halal. So um, the sausages that they were serving at their sausage sizzles were not halal. So none of the Muslim kids could eat them. And he said, I took that to the committee and they didn't want to do that yet. I think our club has got a way to go before it accepts differences in culture. The culture is fairly Australian. I think they decided the participants in the program weren't going to become part of the club properly. And so they didn't just want to spend the money. When we had functions, there was always food that people could eat. It was just the Friday nights, Friday night barbecues, really. I got outvoted on that a little bit. Um, so he was really... Um, Obviously, there were people on that committee who really didn't want to accept um, anybody who was, who, who was culturally different or to make any provisions or make them feel welcome at the club. And really their, their attitude was they're never going to be proper members of our club. Um, so that was, that was a really disappointing experience and we ended up moving all those players to a different club, in fact. And I guess the big issue that I want to address here is in both of these cases and something that's come up in... in, in um, research that other colleagues have done is that people really don't know what to do when they encounter racism. They don't really know how to respond to it. So people who are well-meaning, who are really trying to include people from diverse backgrounds um, are pretty much stumped um, when they encounter these kinds of things. And so that's, um, it, was, it was kind of considering all of those things that we decided to start the project that we're doing now, which is called STARS, and Ramon mentioned it. It stands for um, Standing Together Against Racism in Sport. And in this, we're really just beginning this project, but what we're trying to do here is we're working with a small number of clubs, um, and these are clubs that are already including people from diverse cultural backgrounds um, amongst their members, but who recognise that racism is a problem for those, for those players and athletes. 
and they're keen to do something about it. So we're working with those with those clubs um, and we ha really have sort of three different things that we're doing. Um, we're, we're sort of providing them with anti-racism messaging um, to, to display around the club and, and information about anti-racism. And then we're going to run training sessions with players, parents, coaches, committee members and volunteers at the club um, around racial literacy. So that's going to include cultural awareness and really the, the critical thing or what we hope will be the critical part of that is bystander training or actually calling it upstander training. And that's really about um, helping people, helping clubs to develop a plan that says, okay, if, if and when we encounter racism, this is what we are all going to do together as a club, the whole team, the coach, um, the parents, whoever's there at the time, this is how we're going to respond to it and actually have a plan. Um, and so that that what we hope will be the outcome is that the person who's being targeted by racism um, is surrounded by people who who know how to 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 react to that, both to support that person and to also make it clear that that club has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to racism. Um, so I don't really I can't tell you if this is going to work. I, um, hopefully. We'll know that in about a year's time. We're really just getting started with, with this project. Um, but we've, we've got funding for it. We've got five clubs that have signed up and are very enthusiastic to be part of it. Um, and we have a range of community, fabulous community partners who are working with us as well. And around this, this action project, we'll be doing research um, to see what kind of impacts it has on race, racial literacy, on people's preparedness to act, um, when they witness or experience racism, and also on whether it actually changes people's experiences of racism within the club. Um, so I'll stop sharing that there. And that's really my talk. I don't think I did go for too long, um, but I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Ramon, and happy to uh, answer questions at the end, of course. Thank you. And the honour is actually as a tool us, I think, to follow on from here. Um, yep. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Ramon. I think uh, just before I introduce our next speaker, um, that story you told about the halal food, that hits really close to home to me because when I was uh, playing in Shepparton in the under 18s in one of the clubs there, we had the same issue. We had a team full of Muslims, mainly Iraqi and Afghan boys. And our issue wasn't even that much that we wanted halal sausage sigils. We just wanted um, the chips to be cooked in a separate, uh, I guess, um, I guess a cooking thing, but the club didn't accommodate. So what happened is uh, the team's top scorer and the team's uh, captain, the team that I played for, next year, because of that incident, they left and they joined another team, a rival team. And what happened was that the rival team ended up dominating for the next two or three years. And it was all because the, um, I guess the coach or the president of the football club wasn't willing to accommodate um, to like a single request. And that was all just give us like halal chips because they used to give us coupons after the game. And yeah, so that's my whole personal story. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, that was very uh, educational. And yeah, so our next speaker is Cameron McLeod. Uh, Cameron is a social entrepreneur with over 20 years of leadership experience in leveraging sport to influence social and economic changes across public health, education, community, and major international events. He is the CEO of the Huddle and a member of the executive team at the North Melbourne Football Club. He is regularly engaged by political, corporate, and academic and non-for-profit sectors to help drive systematic change to address complex health issues, social and economic issues facing traditionally marginalized populations and communities across Australia. Cameron's ex expertise include preventing violence against women, urban design, education, and addressing unemployment rates among disadvantaged communities. Cameron attended Harvard Business School and is a Williamson Community Leadership Fellow at Leadership Victoria. His leadership philosophy is to empower others to lead without authority, to bring about positive change in the places they live, learn, work, and worship and play. I would like to now hand the floor to Cameron. 
Thank you so much, Isa, for, for that warm introduction and to Ramon and, uh, and the Chris Fellows to um, bring us all together and, and really explore what the opportunities lie ahead of us through the influence of sport. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm on Wadarung land, which is in Geelong, about 45 kilometres uh, southwest of Melbourne, for those of you who are joining us from interstate. Probably a little bit following on from what, uh, what was just mentioned there around is his um, own personal experiences in Shepparton. Today, the conversation I want to have with you is about being brave and speaking up in the context of seeing or hearing racism and how we as professionals can actually make a difference in the places where we live, learn, work, worship and play. I'm going to share with you my screen. I've got a few slides, shows that are but I too would like to, to share. So just give me two seconds and I'll do that. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that now. In 2015, I joined the Huddle um, as the CEO. Uh, I was briefly, as it was just briefly mentioned, the Huddle is the community arm of the North Melbourne Football Club. It was established to strengthen engagement and amplify opportunities for young people from culturally diverse communities. North Melbourne isn't the, the biggest club in the Australian Football League, but I think what it does in the community speaks for itself. And um, over the past 10 years, we've worked with more than 85,000 young people from over 160 different cultures to help them learn, grow and belong. And we use sport as a vehicle to strengthen education and employment pathways for young people. And it was in 2010, sorry, in 2015, I should say, that uh, this particular cartoon was shown in the Herald Sun. It was in response to uh, some significant issues that were happening, certainly in our community. The Moomba Festival, which is a, a large um, festival in Melbourne around the Easter period, um, happened. And, and there was a, an unfortunate and serious incident that did occur which involved a large number of young people from African backgrounds. And the, the, the media really did sensationalise it. They created uh, quite a lot of angst and anxiety, not only amongst the general public in terms of the fear that they certainly instilled in readers um, when they saw um, people from different cultural backgrounds. It really meant that um, there was a real issue on our hands as to the way in which we portrayed young people um, from, from um, multicultural backgrounds. Um, what I saw from there was an irresponsibility um, from the media. Um, I was certainly aware of the issues of racism, um, certainly on the field and, and on the courts. As a young person, I played a lot of sport and got the opportunity of traveling abroad to, to play basketball. And I would see and hear um, racism, but didn't necessarily know how to address it. Um, being an Anglo, I, I haven't experienced it uh, myself and I see myself as being incredibly fortunate. But I also see the responsibility that I have in others to help be brave and to speak up in the face of, of, of that evil. What I did see from, from that date forward was the insecurity that uh, racism places on young people on a daily basis. Um, what I wasn't aware of is just how prevalent that is. In sport, we, we, we certainly know the opportunities and the roles that we are having to shape attitudes and behaviours and to create safe and inclusive environments for all. But I want us to be really clear that sport, as powerful as it is in bringing us together to create positive change, it also has institutional structural barriers that are reinforcing these issues like racism, discrimination, sexism and violence amongst many other really complex issues within our homes. Um, on the left-hand side here, you, you'll be very aware of the unfortunate effects that racism has had on one of, not only the Australian Football League's greatest players of all time in Adam Goods, but one of the most amazing leaders, um, certainly in my lifetime, in the roles that he's been able to um, shape and create as an outcome of being a proud Aboriginal man. And the the ways in which he's actually brought our awareness and our attention to um, our first peoples and the, the significant hardship that he's had to endure because of the colour of his skin. The AFL and the media have, have acknowledged through um, a lot of soul searching that 
they certainly didn't do enough um, in the face of racism, um, particularly when Adam, Australian of the Year, Brownlow medalist, Premiership player, one of the legends of the game, was constantly booed day in and day out um, throughout the, the last season of, of, his, uh, of his AFL career. What you might not have seen, though, is, is some of the effects that racism is having in other countries. Italy is a, uh, a very uh, complex um, community, um, country with a long history of racism, as, as I've started to research. In um, 2019, a game was called off because of the, the chance of, of racial abuse towards one of the players in the blue. Um, his name is Lakuku. And he was uh, racially taunted um, throughout the course of the game to the point where it was just too um, dangerous for, for, for his health and, and that of other players of, of colour. The commentator of that game on that, uh, on that evening was also cited as saying that the only way to stop him because of his brilliance was to actually feed him bananas. So the media and the role that they're playing in actually reinforcing this negative attitude is, is real. The press, as you can see in that article, has, has also pitted two, two people of colour um, who were playing uh, a game um, as part of their promotion and titling it as Black Friday. Again, a really uh, negligible, um, very destructive um, report there from the media, which absolutely like sport does, it reinforces a type of behaviour. On the plus, you see on the right-hand side here, one of the most iconic images, I think, certainly in my lifetime, from the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, uh, this black power protest from the US and Australian athletes, I might add, Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and a former colleague of mine at Peter Norman. Um, a silent protest on his behalf, but certainly for both Tommy and John, their, their conviction in their actions and being brave and speaking up although the silent one in response to racial injustice throughout that era. And then last year, I think many of us would certainly feel quite emotional with even just thinking about the Black Lives Matter and the injustice that, that it, it had, that the role of sport, both here and abroad, in actually bringing our attention and awareness to the social inequalities and injustices that are, that are happening on a daily basis for men and women of colour people with disabilities, um, for, for our First Nations peoples. These things are happening on a daily basis and sport certainly has brought those injustices and issues, but also I think solving some of those problems to our attention. In 20, 2018, um, I met with a group of young people, um, approximately 100 in total, and, and, and started to, to really listen more intently to how they could play a role in helping to create change and what could they do to um, inform better public policy and practice. A question that we asked a group of young people living in and around the North Melbourne or Flemington areas, which is traditionally a low socioeconomic area, was, well, what keeps you awake at night? And it's a, it's a very simple question um, on the surface, but below it, it's, it's quite a uh, complex uh, response. What I was surprised at, well, sorry, I'll go back to that. What I wasn't surprised about was the response. What I was surprised about is just how prevalent this issue is. The, the response of 98% of those young people that were asked that question was that racism keeps them awake at night. That wasn't what was surprising me. What was where it actually took place, and that was at schools, um, in their workplace, um, on the sports fields and the courts, in supermarkets and in other places that they would see as safe zones, including places of worship. So it's unimaginable for me to think about as a young person, not only trying to navigate the complexities of being a, an adolescent and trying to step into um, this world that's changing so rapidly um, before our very eyes, but to be able to deal with the complexities of, of racism that, um, you know, in, in basically in, in, in an area where, as we've just seen, has been going on for hundreds of years, it really is um, quite shocking and alarming. What we ask these young people to think about is, well, what could they do to help bring about some of that positive change? 
And they recognised that sport was a tool for creating awareness. But also they saw firsthand the opportunities that they could potentially impart some of their knowledge to help build the skills and the knowledge of athletes to get behind a, a campaign, one that they hope to at least cut through um, with, the, with the audiences that they intended it to be, and that being young people. But they had no, they had no necessarily, um, they didn't necessarily have a, have, have a knowledge of how big this campaign could grow. What uh, over the past, uh, over a six month period, they actually um, engaged five different athletes from four different codes, um, from Melbourne United, Melbourne City, North Melbourne Football Club and the Melbourne Stars. They engaged athletes to get behind a campaign called Be Brave, Speak Up. We're going to share that, that video with you um, so you can see that in your own time. But it basically shares a, a very personal example of um, times where people um, have ignored the, the racist remarks and attitudes that um, they have encountered on public transport, in shopping centres and at schools. And then those athletes got behind that message as it helped share and amplify the voices, but also to encourage all of us to be brave and to speak up. Since that was shot um, nearly three, four years ago, um, that campaign's now reached more than 8 million people. And the Australian Human Rights Commission has picked that up and, uh, and shared that um, as part of their Racism Stops With Me campaign, which is a huge achievement in of itself, considering many of those young people often were quite silent um, in their own classrooms. In terms of local actions that you can take to, to be brave and to speak up, I've, I've listed a number of principles here that I think we can all um, work better and together on. The top of that page um, with the fist, that, that's really about giving recognition to, to the, the Black Power protest back in 68. But that is um, more important than ever, I think now, particularly in the context of COVID, where young people from diverse backgrounds will be more acutely affected because of the social and economic injustices that exist both locally and, uh, and globally. But we do need to stand up and, uh, and be brave in the face of these inequalities and have a conversation around the committee of management table as to what is wrong, just like the ones that we've heard earlier today. Um, serving halal food is a non-negotiable and, um, and food like sport helps to bring people together. So that's an easy way and a low cost way in which we can actually start the conversation. Following this around um, in clockwise, the, the, the role of values can't be underestimated. There are really passionate people um, that will drive this type of work on a daily basis, whether it be personally or professionally. But something that I've observed over, over the years is that the importance of having values that you express personally, but also professionally, and aligning your values to those organisations. Values will help guide decisions in difficult times and values will be uh, the bedrock of, of how um, attitudes and behaviours will be shaped to um, strengthen opportunities both within and externally for your organisations moving forward. Partnerships uh, are, are so integral, I think, to, to any um, change process. Uh, the, the saying is that, you know, money makes the world go round. I think that it's about people and it's about finding those that have a similar set of vision and values to that of yourself. There's so many great resources and like the ones that were, that were just shared there by, by other panel members, um, like the studying, uh, sorry, standing together through um, against racism in sport. I think that's a, a wonderful initiative. And that does bring together government, corporate, not-for-profit, and, and of course, those that we aim to, to serve. Education really is at the pillar of, of all of this work. Um, and I've seen a lot of people um, lean in on learning more and more about themselves and through the stories of others. One thing that I would have I've observed over, over, over the years around education is that people can sometimes um, not um, speak up because of fear of getting it wrong. Um, I think the education process is about making mistakes as much as it is about trying to, to do the right thing. So I think that as much as we want to recognise and reward great behaviour and great actions, there are going to be critical moments by which we can also learn through um, mistakes and or failures. And that shouldn't be overshadowed by the, the education process. And then certainly last but not least is, is that megaphone. That really is about amplifying the voices of positive stories. 
the negative media that we talked about at the very beginning of this presentation is a, a real issue that continues to permeate through social um, and mainstream media. Courtney Walsh from The Australian recently wrote a fantastic positive article around the South Sudanese athletes that are, are emerging across different sports across Australia. If you haven't read that, I certainly encourage you to, to pick it up and, and have a look at that. But it's a great example of how um, communities from different backgrounds are being promoted for their, their assets rather than looking through this deficit model. And at the heart of all this is co-design. Those two heads coming together is actually about learning from each other. And I think I've learned more from young people in the past 12 to 18 months throughout the COVID period than, than I could have ever imagined before. And spending quality time with those that you aim to, to service and to serve from the very beginning is, is probably the one piece of advice that I'd share with you all around um, if we're going to create meaningful change across the, the places where we live, learn, work, worship and play, then we must start that conversation together with those that um, have been impacted the most and those that have been most uh, um, of minority groups, including women, um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, those with disabilities and those from different ethnic backgrounds. So on that note, I, I also too would just like to conclude and say thank you for, for your attention and really happy to keep this conversation going as to how we can all play a role to address some of these inequalities in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Um, uh, are we moving on to the Q&A now, Simon? Yeah, thank you so much, Cameron, for excellent. And thanks to all three panelists uh, uh, for sharing their experiences, their actions, also some really, and some really sort of uh, tangible examples, really, of, of some of the issues that, uh, that are being experienced on, a, on an everyday level. Now, uh, as I, we're, we're lucky, we've, we've uh, received a number of uh, really interesting questions uh, that we'd like to put to the panel. And I'll address uh, them to individual panelists, but feel free also to, to handball them to another panelist if you feel you're not you know, best suited to, to address it. So uh, no pressure. Uh, I'd like to start with one really that is a question that I get all the time in terms of the research and more the the sort of the, the, the knowledge translation and the, the social action that, that I'm involved in. And that is, a that is this question. How do you get through to traditional sporting club committees in some respects set in their ways to address racism or the possibility of racism within their clubs? How do you get those clubs along in this process, in this dialogue and, and towards some of the changes that we've talked about? Uh, Jonas, I'd like to invite you uh, to reflect a little bit on that if you feel that is something you can comment on given the various roles you've had. So what, what does that look like, trying to get clubs sort of engaged in this conversation, trying to maybe acknowledge that they're not as perfect as they think they are? Sure. Uh, I've had several years experience in this um, with trying to um, facilitate workshops. Uh, one of them was CMI called The Game Plan as you might be aware of, which goes through uh, a set of, of a plan of how you can create an environment that is inclusive to people of very diverse backgrounds. So that's thinking about, um, you know, a good example before about the, the halal sausages. So that's a very small thing that needs to change. Um, uh, I mean, including other volunteers from those communities. So tapping shoulders of key community leaders and inviting them to be in a committee. Um, looking at your fees and really revising how expensive sometimes it is. And, and in most cases, um, for people that have just newly arrived, uh, paying a huge fee is really not a huge priority, even though they would love to be participating and being in a team, but it is just not feasible to expect them to pay a cost that some of the soccer clubs. I'm gonna focus specifically on soccer clubs because I worked a lot with a lot of soccer clubs. Um, but also just the culture is not, uh, just many things regarding the culture is not very welcoming. So it's not considered of, um, of the different uh, cultures the young people that might be wanting to participate come from. And the committee play a huge role. So if um, the culture in that committee is, is changed and is filtered down to everyone involved in the club, so the volunteers, parents, uh, sorry, the committed volunteers, parents who may occasionally volunteer 
um, you will see a lot of changes. And I have seen one or two clubs that have managed to do it very effectively, but I've also come across around many clubs that uh, where it's oil and talk, but really nothing in action. Um, and uh, I would love to say I have an answer for that, but it, it got really frustrating for me on some occasions where clubs um, who I work closely with and I try to get them to at least change one or two things that will attract people of diverse background uh, and the conversation would go very nicely and we'll deliver and facilitate the game plan. But there was nothing really in action moving forward several weeks later when I would go back to, um, to check in. Um, and for me, from that experience, all I can say is many, many of those committee members are just very comfortable in the culture that they have set and have been around for many, many years. Um, and although they might give me sometimes a feedback that they are looking to change, but what I got is they're just too comfortable in that culture and they're not looking to change. The only times when I do notice change was when they notice an athlete that can really contribute to their club, then they are willing to really accommodate that particular athlete. You know, and I've since I can give several examples. Um, and some who have gone actually to play professionally in the A-League. Um, but what about the remaining 30 to 40, 50 young people that want to play that don't have the same level of talent that particular athlete might have? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a really direct answer except to say that was the culture that they've been working on for many, many years. They're just dead set on that culture and they're not looking to really change away from that. Karen, based on your experience with Count Bien, is there anything you'd like to add given you've worked with so many clubs? Yeah, sure. I think it's a really great question and it's a really and it's a really tricky one. And that's exactly the problem that we we found was even though we might have a champion within the club, there would be other people in the committee who who would refuse to serve halal sausages, but would also they wouldn't consider themselves racist. You know, they, they would say, oh no, it's a matter of people fitting, you know, people just need to fit in. They would have all these rationalizations. Um, I think one thing, one thing that we're doing now with this new project is we're actually working also with local government. And I think local governments can play a role here. So in, in, in one case, um, in our STARS project, we actually have one of the local governments who's partnering with us is, um, is giving money to the clubs who are participating to support their participation. And so I think local governments, um, this, this is kind of pie in the sky, this isn't happening on the ground to any great extent, but I think, I think local governments can step in and say, well, hang on, here are, here are clubs whose membership does not represent their local community. You know, we have, we're sitting here in a very diverse local community and the clubs are full of Anglo people. And that happens, I've seen that again and again. And I think they can be, carrots and sticks you know maybe those clubs um they need to start representing their, their communities properly otherwise they're not going to get some of the things that local governments hand out like ground allocations or perhaps some kind of extra payments for clubs so that's just one thing that's happening in our project at the moment and we'll see how that goes um so that's one idea i think another thing that i think is often effective is is uh for committees is actually hearing the stories of people who are affected by racism um, and because they don't, they, they, it's, it's at such a distance from their own experience that they don't kind of get it. So I think hearing some of those personal stories can really make a difference as well. Um, and, but obviously, you know, it's problematic because it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the job of the victims to teach the people who are racist um, what to do. But I think for those, who, those people who are prepared to stand up and tell their stories, that can be really powerful. And I also really liked Ezra's um, solution in Shepherd and you go to another club and beat them. <laughs> um, well done. Um, if I can add something to that, um, I will probably take it one step further. From my experience, it would be really helpful if you can actually include some of the community members. So I remember in Sheraton, a lot of the uh, community members, uh, committee members of clubs or the leadership of clubs used to be from a specific Anglo background. If you can have some, if you you know, if your team is made up of 50% Africans or 50% Afghans or Iraqis, I think it would be really helpful if you can actually get some of those people from those communities to take part of committees and club leadership. Because I think if you take 
um, somehow uh, encourage that, that might actually help stamp out some of the racism because someone from the community is able to speak on their behalf or have their own input. So yeah, I think that's one way we can address it. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good point, Ezra, because we know that representation is really important. And we had a question on that. I'll just, and, and maybe Cameron might like to comment on that. And then I want to see if we, within the few minutes that we have left, tackle another really, I think, big question that underlies some of this. Uh, but Cameron, so, so the question is, it goes back to what Ezra said, you can't be what you can't see. How, can, how do we fast track the face of contemporary Australia into community sport, right? So this idea that uh, how can we ensure that our community sports environments actually reflect the communities which they represent? And for me, I think I would like to think of that beyond participation, beyond playing, because actually having a strong overrepresentation uh, of uh, black or minority ethnic players can actually, in fact, uh, become productive because it reproduces that myth of natural talent and, you know, uh, so I'm actually thinking, Kevin, in terms of, for example, representation at that level of leadership coaching, uh, what can be done there to really stimulate, really, 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 uh, you know, have better pathways kind of into leadership and coaching positions as well uh, 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 in that regard? Yeah, thanks, Roman. Well, you actually just touched upon exactly my point. I think that the uh, it is important to find meaningful pathways, and I think it's beyond the playing aspects of the game. So coaching is, is clearly, I think, uh, one that, has a great deal of responsibility and influence. And, and coaches, I think, are, particularly in junior sport, probably the most important roles that, that a club can actually recruit for. And how we actually develop people's skills and knowledge will then help develop that network and create greater opportunities in, in, in the broader sense for people to feel truly like they do belong. So I think that there's great, a great amount of effort and energy that I know that many that are on the call here, and I've, it's a number of um, familiar people uh, on the call here, um, who are doing great work at the local level to actually um, find meaningful opportunities for people from diverse backgrounds to be um, coaches. But then to, to Ezra's point, the committee of management is, I think, the next step. And actually having um, a representation, if you could, uh, on your committee that represents the demographic of your community. Now, that's easier said than done, but I think that's truly when we're going to be co-designing the, the, a club environment that is inclusive of all. And until we get to that point, it really will be simply, well, um, we want to open our doors for you to come and play. That's, that's not necessarily being inclusive. That's, that's including, but it's not deeply entrenched in the way in which you might um, provide opportunities and um, equal access um, to, to your club environment. Thank you, Cameron. It's a, I think that's a really important point. Uh, so actually, it would be a very good point to finish on, and I know we're nearly out of time, but uh, I'm going to use my power as, as co-host with Ezra to ask one more question because uh, we have Karen on the panel, and Karen, this, this is really touches upon really your broader professional expertise. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to solve the the issue today, but I think it's really uh, important to put it on the table. So I'll read it out. How can we address the socioeconomic barriers that are the results of systemic racism in Australia and preventing people of color from being able to access mainstream sports clubs? They don't have the funds to pay the fees. They don't have transport available and there aren't enough place-based options available. It's the same issue being going, and going on and on. It's resulting in a segregated community sports system. Stopping individual microaggressions or remarks are important, but it still doesn't address the issue of systemic, uh, the systemic issue of equity. Well, thank you for that very easy question. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, like that, that is all, but that's such a great point. I mean, it's, it's so true. We have all sorts of barriers there and, and cost is, is a really big one. Um, it's, and it's as the as the question pointed out, you know, there's um, structural and systemic racism that is part is partly responsible for people not being able to afford to pay. But we also community sport in Australia is really expensive. It's a lot more expensive than in other countries, and that's a big structural and systemic issue that I think we we need to be addressing at government level. Um, and because it's 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 certainly 
excludes um, people from culturally diverse backgrounds, but it excludes a lot of people, um, not only people from culturally diverse backgrounds, it excludes anybody, you know, lots and lots of people who just can't afford to play club sport. And I think that's a terrible shame um, for all of us. I don't have I don't have the answers to that, but I would be very keen to join with others um, advocating uh, for change in that area. Um, and I think, you know, addressing structural racism at everywhere that it occurs in sport, but in every other place as well, is is part of the answer. But it's the cost of sport is um, is a massive problem. Jonas, would you like a final thought on that that issue? Uh, yes, please. Um, I was just going to add. Um, by saying that some of the things we've done at the Kumin Sakharab is create an alternative, um, which is uh, and do, uh, running um, competition internally with the support of uh, Football Victoria um, that removes many of the barriers. So the fee, uh, the travel, um, and the, the commitment level. So we encourage, uh, so we organize a competition once a week where players can compete in a very formal manner. Um, however, all the barriers that prevents them from participating in a very formal space is, is quite, is very remote. So fee being one of the biggest, but also commitment level because many of them, especially young adults who might have been here less than five years, have so many other commitments outside of soccer or outside of sports that they don't always have time to commit three, two to three days to a club. Um, or pay the fee that's required, uh, and also afford to pay for uniform. Um, and we tried as well as, because the need is so much that we tried to encourage other more established clubs around us to do something similar, uh, but there's been no intake. But I think with, with, um, with everyone contributing, that includes the council and, F and Football Victoria Federation and clubs being really, mm, lack of a term being pressured maybe to create an, an alternative uh, to your, your normal formal competition that will still allow a lot of participation. Uh, but there's been, we probably, I think, unique in the sense that we're the only one in the West that do this. And we've had so many participants that played at a very high level, um, sometimes MPL or state one, they've come to compete at the soccer hub because it suits their need. Thank you, Jonas, uh, for that contribution. Cameron, is there any final remarks you'd like to make on this point or on any of the other issues covered before we close down? I, I think it is such a complex problem and I think Karen and, uh, and Jonas have really adequately summed it up. I think that it's probably a relationship that we uh, have to have with many different organisations to really get at the hub of it all. So I think for me, the, the key message for this is you know, how important partnerships and and finding the right people. And there are so many wonderful people that are making a wonderful contribution. It's how we can work together to actually drive that deep change. Thank you, an important final remark. Ezra, uh, I think that's it pretty much. Any burning thoughts that you'd like to share as we wrap up? No, I think I've said everything that was on my mind. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed the session. Thank you for having me co-host with you and thank you for all the speakers and all the participants. Um, I hope we all learned, learned something productive today. I know I did. Um, and now back to you, Ramon. Mm, thank you. Yeah, we'd like to, you know, on behalf of, of Chris and also on, on, on as I'd like to thank all three of you, Cameron, Jonas, and, and Karen, for joining us today. And I thank the audience members. I thank you also for your questions. Uh, what I'd like to uh, propose is that we keep this, uh, importantly, ongoing conversation. So I really invite you to stay connected and reach out. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording. Uh, and also any of the questions that we were unable to get to, we're more than happy to take those and, and, and see if we can formulate some answers sort of uh, collaboratively on those as well. So please do feel free to reach out. And this is clearly uh, uh, an issue that, uh, that will require sort of ongoing work uh, well into the future. And uh, it's great to hear some of the, the sort of tangible actions uh, 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 being discussed here today. So thank you all very much and uh, hope to see you at the next uh, Chris Race webinar as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.